Well, yes, um, I just want to say welcome to this uh, workshop session on smart city development in South Korea. My name is Anna Sveen Müller and I'm head of the Smart City Research Network at the University of Stavanger. And I'm very excited about this panel that we will hear from today with uh, four really interesting talks, I think, um, about different smart city projects in South Korea. And I think we also cover pretty much the whole uh, Southern Peninsula <laughs> we're region wise. So we have uh, um, presentations about uh, Seoul, about Incheon, um, Busan. And I don't know, jung are you talking about Ulsan or are you talking about Korea in general? Um, yeah. Korea in general, yeah. Uh, but what we will do now is we will just go ahead and start. Um, with the first presentation. And I, each presentation will last about 15 um, minutes. And we will take the discussion after all four presentations. But if you have any clarifying questions, you can ask them right after the, the presentation. Uh, but um, I'll just go ahead and introduce our first speaker, which, who is uh, Yumin Ju from the KDI, um, Okay, let me see, <laughs> sorry. Uh, associate professor at the KDI School of Public Management in Sejong City. Um, and um, I will just leave the word to you, Yumin. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. So everybody can see my slides, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So um, I'm an associate professor at the KDI School. Uh, before joining the school, I actually taught at NUS, National University of Singapore, um, and for seven years. And I think that's why I got interested in smart city topic to begin with, because maybe some of you are familiar with Singapore or not, but Singapore is really talking a lot about smart city development policies and so forth, right? They have this wonderful branding called Smart Nation, and the government is really pushing towards um, building a smart nation as a whole. But today I'm going to introduce you to smart city Seoul, the capital city of South Korea. I'm very glad that we have some other uh, audiences besides the speakers, because at first I was worried, you know, what am I going to talk about to Koreans <laughs> about this um, smart city Seoul? But uh, since I'm sure some of you are not that familiar with um, Seoul smart city policies, and hence I think this might be a interesting opportunity for you to get to know more about the city's policies. Um, so I'll be just briefly introducing to you like the main trends and themes of smart city policies in Seoul. But uh, one thing, well, actually there are two things that I wanna focus on. One is, as you look at from the case of Seoul, the smart city policies didn't happen just overnight, right? It has been a smartization process rather. Um, a process that has been accumulated over the years, going through a lot of um, different master plans. And the second point I want to also highlight is that if you look at this case of Smart City Seoul, you will see a very different kind of po uh, positioning of these policies uh, that are catering to the global audiences versus local uh, audiences. So you can see this interesting kind of interplay between the global and local strategies of Smart City Seoul. The photo I'm showing you here is a Cheonggyecheon restoration project. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this project, but what this is about is basically they tore down the elevator highway and restored this artificial stream. But I thought it was kind of an interesting kind of picture to show to kind of represent my story, which is that if you focus on the local element, it also becomes a global element as well too. And this area, I didn't know about this before, but this area is also apparently um, smart city area, project area. And it has all these sensors kind of detecting the water pollution level, the water levels and so on. So you can see kind of how clean the water is and so forth. All right, so without further ado, we'll move on. So this is a brief geography to show you where Seoul is. It's the capital city and together with the city of Incheon, which you will be hearing about um, in the next presentation, as well as the Gyeonggi province, the entire area is called Seoul Metropolitan City or the capital region. And this part literally comprises 50% of total population in the country. So you can see the importance of this um, 
Seoul metropolitan region, right? And 50% of the GDP is also produced in this region. The city of Seoul itself has 10 million population and 90% of the Seoul residents uh, use smartphones. To me, I feel like that's quite actually a low percentage than I expected. Yeah. So the internet is widely spread out. A lot of public Wi-Fi areas are um, existing and so forth. So I don't know why, like for those of you joining this session, I'm interested in looking at the Korean smart cities. Perhaps the first smart city that you thought about is the case of Songdo, right? Songdo is very well-known popular smart city, but often for negative reasons, right? So I've, I read kind of newspaper articles saying that Songdo is a ghetto for the affluent. Uh, one article actually said it's like a Chernobyl-like area, which is, I think is a little bit exaggerated. Uh, but so actually, if you look at these smart cities rankings, the global rankings, usually it's the Seoul that comes up in rather top rankings, right? For Smart City Index 2017 by Juniper Research, Seoul ranked six, and for specifically focusing on smart city government rankings, Seoul even um, ranked mm -hmm. third, and so on. So it seems like internationally, Seoul is um, getting more um, credit for becoming a notable smart city in Asia. Uh, for in global events like Smart City Expo World Congress, Seoul has won um, urban award as well as you know being acknowledged as the finalist in a number of these events and what was quite interesting to me is that all those commentaries that praised Seoul for being a smart city they always focused on the citizen-based policies you know citizen-centered governance etc right it wasn't about these very fancy state-of-the-art technology and whatnot but it was more about heavily emphasizing you know communicating with the citizens involving citizens and so forth so to me you know that seemed a little bit kind of um something that i didn't expect right because i'm not sure if you're familiar with the korean history but it, we economically developed under this very strong state, you know, the developmental state and the top-down governance has actually ruled the country as well as the city for many, many um, decades. So I was like, okay, so why is Seoul getting recognized for involving citizens in this governance and policy making? So, so I began the presentation explaining how you know, smart cities sold today is an accumulation of various smart city policies, right? And it actually started from the 1999 when the government decided to digitalize all of its government data and put it into the internet system. So it's a computerization um, process that first uh, started to take place. And so here you see the diagram that shows the automation of things and the ease of access and the level of communication. And then next stage was about, you know, showing and communicating these data to the residents through internet, <clears throat> right? And they framed it under the Intelligent City Soul Master Plan. Um, <laughs> so they said, okay, we're going towards the online information and we're going to work with the intelligent a city so was satisfied citizens because now they can see and read all these information online right and get the government services online to them the next stage was a um, use so master plan before the boom of all these smart city kind of you know uh branding so actually the korea government was keen on the ubiquitous cities right i think this ubiquitous term was actually quite popular um, among korean and japanese at the time in the 2000s era so there was a plan called U ubiquitous Seoul master plan and now it wasn't just about um sharing the data to the residents via uh, internet but it was also going back and forth it was about networking right uh, communicating in bi-directional way. So you're also getting inputs and feedback from the citizens as well. And then finally, we have this um, Smart Soul Master Plan from 2011 to 2015. And they're saying that they wanted to have this happy smart city together with citizens. So it seems like when the Seoul government was thinking about this whole digitalization processes and you know, smart city development policies, they were very aware of working with the citizens, right? And trying to improve this kind of citizen-centric governance. 
after the smart city master plan, um, Seoul is now on the Seoul digital plan 2020. And notice how the term smart is removed from this master plan. And the focus is on the kind of changing, the shifting of the whole governance of the city. So within that global digital Seoul 2020 master plan, they have the four pillars uh, that's supposed to represent smart city Seoul. So the first thing is social city, uh, heavily focusing on citizen-led kind of digital governance and strengthening this government and citizen kind of communication. Diginomics is trying to expand Seoul's economy into new growth areas in the fourth industrial revolution. Digital social innovation is about um, improving the quality of life with residents and trying to solve urban problems with these digital technologies. And Global Digital Leader is about tr um, trying to develop so into a global leader, you know, in sharing its policies, uh, digital experiences with other uh, international cities. Um, so I'll briefly go one by one with some key examples, right? Of course, it's not representing the whole plan. And as you can see, some of the key uh, projects that they highlight is actually also part of previous plans as well, but it's um, coming from, it's, it's accumulating and developing and revising from those initial plans. So the first thing is Oasis of 10 million imagination. So as you can see from the title, uh, this project is basically inviting the 10 million Seoul citizens to give policy ideas to the government, right? So in 2017, it was revamped to Democracy Seoul, which is an open platform where citizens can not only um, you know, suggest their policy ideas, but they can actually see and track how their policy is undergoing through decision-making process. So this is basically anyone in Seoul, living in Seoul can um, suggest a policy idea or ways to solve certain um, cities' problems to the government through this online platform. They also have the Seoul Smart Complaint Center, which is an app developed in 2012. And you can basically download this app and report any inconveniences um, you see in your neighborhoods, basically. Any broken windows, um, trash being overflown. You can also report any traffic kind of illegal activities, um, illegal parking, for example, uh, and so on, right? So you can take photos and then you because your smartphone, you can geolocate it and the government can easily find the problem, come and fix it for you. And then they will also tell you the process of, you know, managing this situation. So it really saves a lot of time. And I think the government is also, of course, using the, all the citizen as the imp information inputers, right? They're providing all this information um, that needs to be fixed in the city. And voting, I think, has been quite popular among also international scholars as well that, that who are interested in smart cities. So this program is thinking citizens as prosumers of information, meaning producers and consumers, right? So what they can do is they can um, post some policy ideas and they can also vote for policy ideas suggested by not only the Seoul city government, but also posted by you know, the Seoul residents. So it's moving towards more of a cooperative governance. And it's actually quite widely used, right? And um, a number of these ideas, actually majority of ideas for nearly 4,000 out of 4.4 thousand um, Cape agendas have been posted by the citizens. And since 2015, um, the Seoul government actually uses and voting to have a participatory budgeting where the residents can vote for um, where, vote for the projects that they want to see this um, city, some parts of city budget to be used in. Right, so it's quite interesting. You can even ask for like, where is the best place for no like signal and all those things. Just anything big to small, anything that involves urban life in cities. Okay, so that was the social city example. I'm moving on to digital social innovation. And this is to improve the urban life of ordinary citizens. So what the Seoul government did was it used the big data um, using the cell phone data basically to see where people travel at late night from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. And then they designed the bus routes so that all those um, to increase the mobility rights, right? Because oftentimes it is kind of low income workers, you know, cleaners of the streets, et cetera, that needs these public transportation in these early night hours. 
maybe the Norwegians would take 5 a.m. bus to go to work, but, <laughs> right? So instead of doing the expensive survey and so forth, they relied on the big data to get the most accurate bus routes as possible. And so this has been catching a lot of, this has gained a lot of international attention for, you know, very kind of positive uh, smart city policy. In addition to that, so open big data campus providing over 5,000 data sets. You can, anyone in Seoul can register, go use the data equipment, the space to, you know, create, help create, co-create the urban solutions. Um, this is kind of a mix of digital social innovation and digital mix. And Seoul government has an interest of turning the entire city Seoul into a living lab centered on local startups, SMEs, and citizens. So it wants to build this ecosystem where the um, small companies and citizens can cooperate. And this is actually quite a big gesture on the behalf of government because the Korean economy is literally dominated by these large chebar conglomerates like Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, perhaps some of you are familiar with those names, right? And 10 of these companies actually comprise more than 80% of GDP. So you can imagine how heavily the economy is reliant on them. So as a capital city government, now they're trying to really promote and nurture the local um, startups and small SMEs through these kind of building IoT living lab and so forth. Right? So the first case that they tried out was the Bukchon IoT living lab. They built this um, so IoT center and digital innovation park for the small companies um, and startups. Because of the time, I'll just go very briefly on these two points. The final, final pillar is about the global digital leadership. So the Seoul government is not only building the global platforms, bringing the international um, kind of actors together to cooperate on the smart city issues. Also, they host a lot of these global events to bring all these um, tech companies as well as the governments, et cetera, to work together. So we really try to boost up the global standing of the Seoul government. But I also want to highlight behind all that mo motive, there is a, this underlying goal of trying to promote a new export, um, trying to promote smart city as a new export item. And the reason why the Seoul government is so-called trying to export many of these smart city projects and policies to other cities is because they, again, they want to support their own local SMEs, right? Um, by, by kind of sharing these policy ideas, they're trying to kind of open up doors for their own local SMEs to go out into these markets and sell their smart city technologies. And this works because we're now seeing a rising global intercity networks. And, and the Seoul government even established a special local council to support the SMEs working in the smart city projects. So to summarize, I feel like to Seoul citizens, Seoul government is very shy in branding themselves as smart city. And I think that's because they're really pushing towards this uh, prioritizing citizens, the small companies, and while because of the past experiences of smart city projects in Korea that focus on these massive new smart city developments, I think they kind of wanted to distance themselves from that kind of project, right? So they really are build, building this positive policy narrative with the local society of you know, promoting bottom-up innovation, um, promoting SMEs, <coughs> citizen participation, as opposed to kind of chevre dominated economy. To global audiences, however, is very active in promoting a smart city and seeking to elevate not only the um, city's global standing, but you have to also see this underlying goal of trying to open up the doors for local start startups and SMEs to find international markets. In the end, I feel like there's over a synergy, right? All this kind of prioritizing citizens, I think, catches attention, the global attention, and hence it kind of enhances the smart city brand of Seoul overall. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yumin. It was a really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, before we go to the next speaker, I just wanted to know if there are any clarifying questions. Uh, if not, we will save uh, the questions that you may have until the, after the four presentations. Um, I don't think there are any, so we will move on to our next speaker, who is Doshi Yang. Uh, and Doshik, you are um, 
now you just you you are working on the Busan Eco Delta Smart City National Pilot Project, uh, and um, maybe you can just go ahead and start your presentation, um, and okay, um, introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, can you see the my slide? Yes. Yes. Uh, yesterday I got a problem with some in the conference. So, okay, let me check. Um, anyway, thank you for having me here for introducing Korean smart cities and this. Um, today, I'm very much practical side rather than general mega trend of smart city. It's important, but uh, how Korean government actually they invest the money and designate it to national pilot project. There are two pilot projects, but one of them is Busan. Echo Delta Smart City. So we actually, I embarked in this project for last seven years. I master planned many part of 11.7 square kilometers, very huge land. And then three years ago, uh, Korean government designated two national pilot projects. One of them is Busan Echo Delta Smart Cities. So today I'm going to show how Busan Eco Delta Smart Cities master plan, what are the key elements of the smart cities, and the meaning of the Korean smart cities, the key, key presentation themes today. So um, before I start, I'm just introduce the, the title. Uh, smart cities everywhere, but I do believe smart cities good words, but I do, I would prefer future proof is much sustainable than smart cities. Smart city looks like very technological side, right? So we actually start with new title for Busan Echo Delta Smart City. So future proof city is a main you know, kind of title. It all comes with Busan Echo Delta Smart City presentation around the world. Okay, hold on. Yeah, a little bit the uh, facts of the location. As you see, the Korean is small countries and the Busan is uh, situated at southern part of South Korea. It's a seaside cities. We actually has Delta area, which means the sea and river uh, meet a certain point. We call it Delta. That's why we call it this project Delta Smart City. So this is the location. It has very interesting location because it has international airport on the top side and the fifth largest logistic terminal is located near to just 50 minutes away. The one more thing, if you fly from that airport, 25% of the world population, you can reach out from that location. So it's, it seems very infrastructure point of view is very interesting. So we expecting Busan Eco Delta Smart City gonna be as, as a city, it will attract many investment and people. At the same time, we are exporting Korean smart city technology through the through the, this project, national pilot project. Okay. Yeah, it's very slow, sorry. But this is an overview of the Busan Eco Delta Smart City. As you see, it's very located, beautiful waterfront area. So last five years, I was a master fan for this one, global cultural waterfront. And then three years ago, two years, sorry, two years ago, two and a half years ago, the Korean government designated certain part of this land as Smart City National Pilot Project. So it's totally 11.7 square kilometers. And then we got a planning permission 2014, which means it, it has to be done using taxpayers' money. So it is an ongoing project. It's gonna be very interesting how it's gonna be changed next 10 years or next five years or 15 years. I'm expecting more than 10 years it will take to shape real shape of the smart cities in the futures. So um, it's, we actually 
K Water, uh, I work for Bipo. K Water as a, a public corporation which is going to implement Korean national smart city. So we start with the visions. As uh, the pre previous presenter said, we have the good experience of UV quarter city, but it has many problems. It has many, many people are criticized about UV quarter city is not, not really, really it makes Korean brand, something like these kind of questions. So we start Korean smart city as a national pilot project. The smart city has to a kind of innovation in terms of process, technologies, and governance because making cities decision making process we we are we have to innovate the way of making smart cities the way using technologies how we cooperate with various stakeholders is, is very important we noticed that so we thought this is very important foundation for korean national pie project especially in busan eco delta smart cities and then we internally we discussed many times about what is Korean smart city should be. And then we arrived at very clear destination of Korean smart city is quality of life. So what is the real purpose of technology? It should be not just the technology itself. It should be more like improve people's life and then solving the urban problems and liberating certain kind of you know governance systems through the technology so that is important criteria for making judgment on how we develop korean smart cities so anyway to make a smart city is not just exaggerating propaganda so national government they designate 2.8 square kilometers as you see on slide we cannot you know we we, we cannot cover all these 11 point square kilometers because of limited time and limited financial resources so we focus on these areas as test bed area national smart city test bed area so it means it could be successful but it could be not successful, but it could also accept it because it has to be the area. So that is a very different approach compared to previous government. It's not always necessarily successful, but it has to be tested here. And then we spread out all these experience to local government levels. That is why we probably the central government, they choose these two Korean national value project. The other one, the Sezong city in South Korea. That is the main area of smart city uh, designate area. As you see, I do believe the, the perfect smart city is nature, not technology itself. So we start with foundation, maximize the potential of the waterfront and the nature it has. And then technology has to support sustain nature, sustainable environment, sustain you know, people's life with the nature. Th that is the different approach on we we don't just uh, inventing technology. So that that part is very criticized by the outside world. Korean smart city is too technological, too technology driven investment. That is a criticism from the outside world. But we realize that that is somehow it's very much true. So we we maximize the potential of the nature on the waterfront to the designated area. That is a strong foundation. I do believe this is very good approaches. And then and then we we master plan uh, more than fifty five or fifty people that we work two year, for two years, day and night. So we provide services, service-based smart city technology on these des designated areas. So I'll explain later, but it means 
we nature is a foundation and then smart city technology will provide services not technological installation on on these designated area that is a, a little bit a little bit you know gap but it makes big difference because services are really people driven approaches you invest and in, you invent this new technology but people don't experience that technology it doesn't necessarily it's not it's not successful. So that is a uh, two main issues. So we start from foundation of nature. Nature is a perfect smart cities, and we provide service on, on top of that using smart city technologies. And then this is a very important uh, indicators. Actually, I presented several president of from ASEAN countries, ASEAN countries, but they like it very much because. Uh, these six key, key performance indicators, as you see on slide, it's really focused on services and everyday services for people. So let's, for example, as long as you live in, in Busan Eco Delta Smart City, you will save 125 hours per year. Uh, that is a very challenging propaganda, but we set up this kind of, you know, KPI, key performance indicators. Also, those persons who are living in here, they will live longer, five years longer than any other cities in, in smart city. You don't believe it, but I actually did it the same way in World Bank in Washington DC. The vice president was a woman. She was very lucky. So I said, I'm pretty sure you're living in a Korean smart city in Busan, your skin will be more healthier than any other woman around the world. So that was my propaganda, but it has, it has evidence. I'm not just talking about propaganda, it has evidence. So this kind of six key performance indicator, I published how it happening. So small palm size, you know, books, baby Anders, I will, I will share with you in the future, right? So 100% recycling, and plus 20% renewable energies and work and balances recycling 100%. This is key performance indicator which drive Busan Eco Delta Smart City, how it looks like in 10 years and five years. So it becomes national law. It's a kind of the central government accepted these key indicators as, as a good example. So every local government they went out in bed, they, they construct smart city, they have to provide key performance indicators. So that is uh, our role, one of our role. And then you see the, uh, this uh, another diagram. Actually, I subdivided six key performance indicators into 28 sub indicators. As you see the outside the outer circle here, there are 28 more indicators we divide into in very detailed manners. So it means each development in smart city area, we will calculate it, how it, how it you know, contribute to achieve these key performance indicator. This is still ongoing projects. It's very beginning, but we are setting up step by step how gonna we achieve these key performance indicators in three years and six years maybe at the end of the, the city was completed. But that, that based on that, you know, uh, key performance indicators, that that key performance indicates actually something to do with very important key play, key elements. As I said before, people, nature, and technology all come together. And then we, we are going to, produce certain outcomes based on key performance indicator approaches. That is uh, very exceptional approaches compared to UV quota cities in South Korea. People actually has a good you know, opinion on these approaches. Has, it is still ongoing, but uh, we are going to do step by step uh, every year. So um, as one of uh, uh, key performance indicators, five years longer health life. So how it gonna be achieved coming futures. So we, we 
uh, to achieve this aim, we provide smart city technology. There are many technologies, as you see here, one to eight, but I will show one example. How are we gonna achieve five years longer health life? So we are setting an urban planning concept. Within 15 minutes, every person in the city will reach out waterfront, green park, and public space. Actually, we designed the exact same way. So according to Cancer Research Center in, in USA, how, how many of you works it will contribute to your health condition in the future? So this is the kind of, of calculation, five years. And also, smart city technology will provide very interesting you know, uh, flooding forecasting, and early response to fires and earthquake. It also makes contribution to your 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 life and your health, health life, especially health life in, uh, regarding uh, five years long health life perspective. So I, I cannot explain all, all, all of them the, in detail, but this is the one picture so we thinking. So you on your right side, yeah, so those people living in Busan Ecuador, the smart city, the other side we lot, but but to be, to be honest, I mean, this is our important key performance indicator approaching to make Korean brand smarter cities. Okay, um, this is a, a, the second key performance indicator, work and life balances. Um, using the robot technologies and LWP, we call it learn workplace. So the, every space has become workplace and living places, also entertainment places. This is the, the concept, one of the concepts we are thinking of uh, smart city areas, more exciting and more futuristic lifestyle, you know, lifestyle achievements in, in this area. So renewable energy. Uh, one, one typical example, a good example of this one, we are using the water as a heating and cooling system. That is very, maybe in Northern Europe, uh, there are some, some you try on using the water as a cooling and heating system, but we are uh, first time in South Korea, but there are plenty of water resources around the designated area. So we are using that water as renewable energy to, to residential area. That is uh, cost, very costly a lot, but we experimenting uh, smart village area using uh, water thermal energy for, for smart you know, technologies. That, that's one example, there are many, but one example. Recycling 100% is, is a very general, but we, uh, there are no waste from no, no waste water from the human settlement. That all has to be recycled by the smart city technology. But if this is a kind of aiming the target, not you know 100%, but aiming we recycling 100%, especially waste water and waste from residential and commercial areas, the key elements. They're saving one to five hours. Um, this is a, um, we are very excited about when you set up how we can save one to five hours. But we thought mobility, uh, especially smart parking and autonomous mobility will save 60 hours, but it's not you know, certain numbers. It has calculated by ourselves. So 60 hours and public safety, also save 35 hours. And productivity, especially the administration processes, as uh, the first president said, Seoul has a, a digital government, something like more, more sophisticated administrative process using smart city technology will save 21 hours. So total, we thought one to five hours um, saving those who are living in smart city. So, I'm, the reason I'm showing this kind of simple calculation, maybe many people will doubt whether it will be really successful, but this is the way to San Ecuador, the smart cities are very much key performance indicator based. 
and then service-based approaches to really impact on people on the cities, not just technological tests or technological installation, which are not used, used by other people. So that is, uh, we are going to step-by-step -step, uh, approaches uh, in the future, how we're gonna achieve smart cities in, in, in total, in total manners. Yeah, another point, I'll be quick. Um, as you see, the, the smart city is not just the designing physical world. I believe 50% of smart cities data, how you managing data, how you operating data, how you dealing with the data, meaningful visualization or using as a decision making process. So this is a big data, AI, IoT is a key elements. It's very obvious the central government is uh, exporting smart city as a package to the rest of the world. As you see, Korean smart city, Korean economic structures, nearly 70% is exportation compared to 25 or 30% uh, developed country. So that is a key element of smart, smart, making smart city, especially in Busan, Ecuador, Delta smart. So we are cooperating many expertise from many, many areas, especially mobility, environment, VR and augment realities and MR. So, so we are now doing uh, fifty percent of this digital world economy, or using this world as making smart city more specific, is key driving forces at the moment. So we set up platform. Busan Echo Delta Smart City will be based on this important three concept of platforms: so digital platform, augmented platform, finally robot platform. We thought maybe in, in, in 10 years when the smart city is completed, every household will have one robot. It, this, this is a kind of a future uh, blueprint of how we are living in, in, in next 10 years or 20 years. So this platform is based on this platform. We set up various experimenting you know, technology, for example, this is one example of digital transformation of virtual reality. So we, we designed, we simulated, we visualized Busan Echo Delta Smart City area, certain part of area in virtual world. And then when you wear the goggles, you will see really similar images of how it looks like. So last year, actually, I done planning process using the goggles to Get a planning commission, but they are very excited about because they see the real world in real situation. Looks like a real situation. So, so this is a the way of how we making smart city in Busan is process technologies and governance is all come together rather than just the technology itself. That is one example. And then finally, we also simulated how it looks like when the flooding system is broken and then tsunami come to that designated area. We simulate, but I, I will not show the whole images, but that is uh, very interesting because we using smart city technology for decision-making process, how we design buildings and security, parks and riverfront. Yeah, that is, uh, one thing we are going to do at the moment. So to summarize, um, the Busan Echo Delta Smart City is really based on key performance indicator, not experimental technology itself. And then we move on how we're gonna achieve it. But 50% of smart city is data-driven management and operation, operation issues. So we invest in this area as a national scale, how we're gonna set up virtual smart city environment at the same time. We call it digital twin. Some people say digital twin. 
And then, as you see, especially in Northern Europe, they are very strong at the citizen engagement. I think you have to wrap up soon. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I gotta, yeah, okay, I'll wrap up with the last slide. So all these processes come with uh, various stakeholders. So key players and government, the local government, even private sectors, they, we, they come together to you know, make a contribution to make a smart city as a national project. And then using that living net network, we are going to do more like uh, service-based on realistic contribution to people's life. That is uh, uh, one, one thing we are very focused on uh, coming years. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, really interesting to, to hear more about this project. Uh, if there are no like clarifying questions, then we will just move on to uh, Jungwon, who will talk about Songdo City, and then we can take the discussion afterwards. Uh, Jungwon, please go ahead. I think you need to unmute. Jungwon, you need to unmute. Uh, I am trying to share my screen and it's not working. Uh, I think uh, Toshi has to stop sharing his oh, screen I see. first. Yeah. Oh, this is... So in the meantime, um, let me introduce myself. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you, Anders, for inviting me for this, uh, for this, to this session. And thank you uh, all in the audience for coming here. Uh, yes, I am, I am teaching at University College London, and, and, but I also have an adjunct position at University of Seoul. Uh, right. Do you see now? Do you see my slides? No, not yet. No. Oh. How about now? No. Maybe choose the right screen. Maybe two, among two screens. Mm. Oh, so I didn't, I didn't click share, right? <laughs> now you see, right? Yes. Now it works. That's yeah. great. Right. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> right. Something. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I'll just do it this way. I mean, I, I couldn't maximize. But, uh, so the, pre the title of my presentation is Who Built the World's First Smart City Songdo? And a behavior institutionalist analysis. And so let me give you a bit of a background for this. It's so literature, there is like a vast literature about smart city, but it's mainly about what questions, like things like what is a smart city and what should we, what should we do uh, and that sort of thing. So, uh, so what I want to ask in this paper is who, uh, rather than what. So it's, uh, it's, it's who builds a green, greenfield smart city? That's, that's my question. Uh, is it real estate developer or is it IT firm or residential or government? And this is important question because the different actors have different visions of a smart city. And it's, it's also important because um, different, the, the characteristics of the actors influences to uh, the process as well as the outcome of a smart city building. So it is, I guess um, it's important, uh, right. So who built the world's first smart city Songdo? So let me give you the brief version of my answer and then go back to the longer version of the answer. So, um, short version. So it's a, it's a, the Songdo is widely believed and celebrated as, as, a, as, as a first smart city uh, among non-Korean researchers. This is, the, um, here is some, <clears throat> a few uh, papers that cite uh, Songdo as world first smart city. And, but in the meantime, Korean researchers have been quiet about Songdo as a smart city. Uh, I wrote two papers, uh, and then I also have other colleagues who wrote about Songdo and then they didn't say much about um, smart city aspect of Songdo. So, so this is my answer to 
the my own research question. So who built the world's first smart city Songdo? The Cisco advertised that they built Songdo as the world's first smart city, but Cisco didn't build it. And the second, Songdo is hardly a smart city. So my answer to the, my own question would be nobody. So nobody built world's first smart city Songdo. So for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of, of Songdo, uh, the, the, uh, the Songdo development, here's a few uh, geographical and, and historical facts about uh, Songdo. So this is the location of Songdo, and it's very close to Incheon International Airport, connected with very long bridge. And so this is a photo of Songdo a few years back, and so if you go there right now, you will see a few new apartments around here, but largely not very different. So this project is, is a quite big project. It's a, like a mega project, a lot bigger than regular mega project. So it's a target population was 60,000 residents and uh, 260,000 jobs was supposed to be created. And the site is 5.7 square kilometer and the budget was 15 billion US dollar. So at that point in time, it was called that uh, the biggest uh, uh, built environment project in, in Korean history. So it is a mixed use development, including convention center, international school, hotel, etc. Uh, it was planned for the completion in 2015, but it's still work in progress. The developer would be Gale and the POSCO. Gale is an American real estate development company, uh, a small company, and the POSCO, uh, for those of you who, are not, who don't know POSCO, POSCO is one of the biggest uh, still producer in, in, in the world. It's a Korean company uh, and, and it, has, it has construction division. So POSCO was part of the developer and at, this, at the same time, they were the biggest contractor of the development. So I'll give you some, I, I'll present this project as, as a historical narrative, and that way you will see the smart, how the smart city concept was introduced to, to, the, um, to this project. So um, the development started only in 2005, but uh, it had a very long prehistory. Even in 2008, in 1980s, there was a discussion about Northeast Asian, Northeast Northeast Asian business hub on the same site. And then in the late 1980s, the name was changed into Songdo Newtown, uh, emphasizing the residential aspect of it. And then in late, in late 1990s, Incheon Free Economic Zone was designated after East Asian economic crisis. And the Songdo is the main part of it. There are three sites in it, but Songdo is the, the biggest part. Uh, and at different stage of this development, it was called Eco City, New City, Green City, Creative City, Industrial Cluster, and, and a lot of other concepts as well. So these concepts, like very eye-catching concepts are necessary at each phase of development to appeal to policymakers, public, uh, potential users, and the financiers. Uh, at the UCT phase, ubiquitous city that uh, and you mean and 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 the Toshik talked about that came to Songdo in early 2000. Uh, as as they already mentioned, it is related to South Korean uh, related to the South Korean government's aspiration for the exporting the city. Uh, so it is the idea is combine the country's strength in IT and then experience in U Town and then put them together under the brand of UCT to export the urban development industry. So this is, this is a legacy of a state-led export-oriented economy. So if you are familiar with South Korean uh, economic history, you would know that the um, shipbuilding industry and the semiconductor industry, mobile phone industry, uh, I mean, these are one of the ones of the most important industries in South Korea. They were built this way. Uh, the government protected the market 
and and the promoted the DJ industry and the DJ industry enjoyed economy of scale uh, within the domestic market and became internationally competitive and then the government opens the mark opens the market uh, and then they went out as, as a competitor and the globally competitive firm so so this so the, the idea is to create uh, city export industry in this exactly same way uh, it's and and when and this concept was developed this way and then Posco and the Gale liked this idea because I'm um, the first of all it was eye catching. I said earlier that eye catching concepts are necessary for uh, for urban development and the youth city wasn't that different from other concepts like a green city or or industrial cluster etc so and then secondly government liked the youth city because government at that time was pushing it and Posco and the Gale would want to work with um, government so they embraced this concept and then most importantly introduction of a UCT concept would not cause any major change in the project. That's very important. Uh, create, in, in, they, they brought this concept not to, not because they want to innovate the project, but not to change the project. Uh, but but that that's, but they did change a few things, but minor things, not and not nothing major. The, the the biggest change that they made was this. Uh, they came up with they had uh, they had a, a UCT plan. Uh, when you have a comprehensive plan of the development, there are other kind of subsidiary plans for different aspects: economic development plan, service plans, etc. So IT plan had used to be part of electricity plan. But now they have a separate plan called the UCT plan for IT only. So that's the biggest change that they made. Uh, and, and so under this plan, what they did was um, installation of a structured cabling, uh, public address system, home networking, parking management, electricity, and the lighting control, entrance system, etc. So these are quite nice um, at that point, the cutting edge uh, IT services, but I, I want you to notice that none of these are like a sci-fi level, uh, uh, sci-fi level technology. They were already available at that time. And, uh, but then there were some innovative innovate, uh, services planned. Um, they were going to implement local uh, he remote healthcare and, and urban information and education and the counseling services. The plan was to bring the best brands of South Korea. Like they were going to bring Seoul National, Seoul National University Hospital for health counseling. And then they were going to bring, uh, bring Mega Study, the biggest um, private tutoring company for after, after school tuitions. So th th they had a plan. But then all of these, almost all of these interesting plans had to be canceled because the South Korean government implemented the price cap for the to, for new houses. So to reduce the pro production cost, they had to abolish all these services. Uh, and that cancellation turned out to be blessing because the same kind of services became available nation nationwide within two, three years because of a fast development of smartphones. So, uh, and, then, and then around 2008, um, it was clear that South Korean government does not push UCT concept any longer. So UCT stage of Songdo is gone. So, uh, so at this point, when this UCT plan was there and they were installing IT services, there is no Cisco there. So Cisco came into picture in 2009. Actually, they were selling their products to LG uh, before this, but they were just selling the products, not directly involved in the project. But in 2009, uh, they wanted to be involved in it more directly. Uh, with the concept of a smart city because they were pushing smart city. And the Cisco acquired the share of a developer in, uh, in 2011 with 30 million US dollar, which is tiny. Uh, 
uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot of money for, for people like us, but if you compare this against the budget of the total, it's, it's like 0.2% of the project budget. And then this money that they invested, they took it back by selling the telepresence, which is, uh, which is a teleconferencing system. Uh, so when so they knew about it, I mean, LG and the Gale and the POSCO knew about this from the beginning. So they, they knew that Cisco is not going to contribute too much, but they welcomed the Cisco because Cisco is famous and the smart city at that time was very fashionable. So, uh, you know, when you build a new development, you have to advertise globally and Cisco and, and the smart city would be extremely useful in advertising, advertising the new development. So, so developer really welcomed it. And then, then what about LG, then who was in charge of uh, IT element of the development? They didn't mind, they didn't welcome because uh, they are not part of this development any longer. Because they already sold everything. They, they did uh, provided the services of cable installation and, and uh, uh, addressing system and, uh, and the parking management system. They made money and now they are out. So they didn't care. So the biggest uh, remaining facility, the remaining legacy of Cisco's involvement in, in Songdo is this. It's called the Cisco Innovation Center. They have this innovation center several places in the world. And basically this is a display, display room. You know, if you go to IKEA, you have like rooms with IKEA furniture, right? It's a something like that, like a bigger version of it with IT products, but nothing that different. So they have a display room and that's pretty much it. That's, that's, that's all what they did. And, uh, so then why did Cisco do it, right? Uh, uh, they didn't spend the money, but they also didn't make that much money. Or, uh, the main reason was the, to claim the credit. You know, Cisco was a latecomer to the smart city industry. Smart, IBM was the forerunner. So they had lots of consulting projects with local governments in the United States. And at the beginning, they were doing it pro bono. So they accumulated the know-how and then later on, they were providing services in local government in, in United States. So they, they had lots of like a big portfolio of a smart city industry. So they were ready to compete in international market. Cisco came, but they didn't have anything. So Cisco had to say that, uh, Cisco, want, Cisco wanted to say that what IBM did was like providing tiny budget services to local government, but we built a real smart city from scratch and look at Songdo. That's what they want to say. And Incheon City and then Gale and POSCO didn't mind. Actually, they welcomed it because they want advertisement. Cisco was doing advertisement for free. So Incheon was happy, Gale was happy, and the POSCO was happy about it. So, but then okay, let's, uh, let's, let's step back a little and then let's uh, try to theorize this a little. I mean, this is out of just one case. So there is a limitation of a generalization, but uh, we, we can try. Uh, it's a, it's a, the first thing that we can notice is that developer and IT firms have a very different agenda. Developer get involved in, in a project, big project like this, and they concentrate on and they work on the project for 20, 30 years. But IT firms get in and they get out quickly. They had to do it because they are on, running on a different business models. Uh, firstly, there is a financial limitation. Cisco is obviously much bigger than Gale. It's a very big company, but there is a financial limitation because Cisco have to run many different projects at the same time. But companies like Gale, even if they are small company, they concentrate everything on one project and work on it for like 20, 30 years. And then they take risk of, of um, I mean, real estate firms take much bigger risk than, than companies in any other sector. It's every project is life or death situation. That's the way they do it. So, so uh, the financial uh, capacity, financial resources that they can uh, 
uh, mobilize is actually much bigger than an IT company can for one project. And then there is also temp temporal incapability between real estate development and, and IT. IT is really unpredictable. As, as I said earlier, so you know, this cancellation of the services that uh, uh, you, LG and, and uh, uh, Songdo UCT came up with, that was a blessing because they, uh, taken, they didn't see what's going to happen in two years. So that's why, I mean, so, it's, so that is why uh, big IT companies like Cisco develop something. And if you, if you come up with a new product, they have to sell and then go out. And if you try to create a plan long time ahead, there is a very big chance they get it wrong. So, so you see like a real estate industry that requires uh, 30 years of commitment and then IT company that requires very quick sales and, and, and out. So these two doesn't meet, uh, doesn't match very well. So for the, for the greenfield development, like a smart, uh, greenfield smart city development, IT firms cannot be the main driver. So that's, that's the conclusion. And I think that's important to conclusion because there is a, you know, it's a Companies like IBM and Google advertise themselves as a smart city developer. And they can build a couple of buildings and they can call them smart city. But if it is a city uh, bigger than uh, a district scale, it cannot be IT firms. Uh, you know, these, um, these cutting edge uh, pilot projects that Doshi was talking about, we noticed that the main developer was Kwata. So Kwata has a lot of experience in, in urban development for, you know, Ulsan was developed by, by Kwata. So it's a Kwata, although it is focuses on hydro, uh, hydro uh, civil engineering. So they, had, uh, they have accumulated a lot of urban development experiences. So they are urban developer. So companies like that can be uh, the main developer of smart city, greenfield smart city. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's it. And then this is a bonus about Songdo. <laughs> it's uh, this scene, the three scenes from uh, Gangnam Style. These photos were taken in Songdo uh, subway station, not, not in Gangnam. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for the really interesting uh, presentation. And, um, and it was also nice. I, I did research on Songdo back in 2010 and, and pretty much quit that project uh, because I decided to do something else. But uh, so it was really nice to see an update on, and, and some of, like more in-depth analysis of, of what happened in Songdo during that time. If there are no questions, then we will move on to Jung Sub Kim from Ulsan National Institute of Technology, Science and Technology, and he will talk about COVID-19 uh, and the privacy debate around these uh, surveillance and monitoring technologies. jung -Sub, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I will share the, my screen. So is it okay? The yes. Screen? Okay, so the my presentation is a little bit different perspective looking at looking on the smart city. So I believe the risk, uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many digital technology widely applied and uh, during this process, many personal information actually used to uh, prevent the infectious disease. So, as uh, Doshing mentioned, the data is very important and how the citizen uh, people's uh, thinking, how, they, how their personal information or their uh, data is used in a smart city is very important. So I think the, with the COVID-19 case shows, so one kind of uh, provided some clue to how we can make smart cities, data-driven smart cities uh, in the near future. So, okay, I will, 
So the some background research question I have is how the COVID-19 pandemic affects the future of smart cities from the perspective of uh, privacy. And there was one the major the news in the smart city business was uh, during this uh, Corona pandemic, the, the Sidewalks Labs, it is a uh, uh, alphabet, the uh, Google's, the one of the Google is a subsidiary company, and they had a uh, for about three years they had a new pro smart city project in Toronto in the waterfront uh, Toronto, and but they declared that they will stop this project. They uh, officially uh, told, uh, told that the uncertainty in the economy was uh, the, the reason, but uh, many people uh, recognize that this, uh, the main reason was uh, many citizen group in the Toronto actually opposed to this uh, smart city project because the Google's approach to this uh, data collection using the IoT sensor in this uh, waterfront Toronto was not transparent and how they manage and use this data was not clear. So many citizens have uh, some concern of the, their privacy. So uh, this kind of privacy concern was uh, one of the big barrier to the smart city development and service. But the other use we recently heard about the uh, smart city or this technology is uh, in order to respond to the corona pandemic, the many digital technology is widely applied. So the, according to WHO's report, some kind of uh, contact tracing tools and proximity tracing tools and symptom tracing tools are very actively applied across the world. So uh, from my presentation, I will uh, explain some kind of uh, approach of in Europe and in, and also uh, the Korean case, and then uh, showing some the debate in Korea about uh, regarding the privacy issue. So uh, briefly, the contact tracing technology is based on the using find the personal location information uh, based on the, uh, there are many ways, but the main three way is uh, first using the Safe on tower uh, connection data, and then using the tri triangulation technology, we can find the location of uh, who used the smart device. The other one is uh, simply using the GPS system. And uh, lastly, the Bluetooth based system is a, uh, Bluetooth is uh, only provide about uh, 30 meters distance uh, and they can exchange their signal between the smart device. So this Bluetooth-based system uh, can accumulate the, the data which is smart device can be exchanged the signal. And using this uh, information, we can find who, uh, which person are very closely interacted with the uh, confirmed case. So that is the way the uh, Bluetooth technology, uh, Bluetooth-based uh, contact tracing works. So among these uh, three uh, technology in the Europe, uh, in European countries, they are much more sensitive to privacy protections. So uh, the many the European institution make some one guideline for this kind of privacy preserving uh, contact tracing methodology. It's a one uh, one is uh, one of the most, uh, uh, the one of them is a pan-European privacy preserving proximity tracing tool. And uh, this one is uh, simply using the Bluetooth signal and uh, they collect the data who interact with the nearby smart device Bluetooth signal and store that information in the smart device. But when someone is uh, confirmed as a uh, positive in COVID-19, all this information is uh, provided to the server of the central government. And then 
the government's department to use this information for contact tracing and to making the people to get the test and something like that. So this is considered as a centralized system. So even they use a Bluetooth system, the central the government can know about who in uh, the interaction between people is using this data. So because of these concerns, the other many research group in Europe propose a decentralized system we call the DP3T, the decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing tool. And this one is a government to not intervene in this process. When a, a person confirmed as a, a COVID-19 case infection, so the only the information is uh, stored in the smart device of the owner. And then when they he confirmed the information is automatically delivered to the contacted person. And during this process, government do not intervene and cannot see any information. So it's much more privacy protected way. But this kind of system is one problem is uh, this is based on the participation of the, the citizen. They have to install the app and use uh, uh, activated the Bluetooth uh, use on their smart device. So because of this reason, the, even the many European country developed the contact tracing app, the, not many uh, people uh, participated here. So one news report says that in the France, it's only 2% of the population uh, participated in this, uh, uh, they installed this app. Even in Singapore, they applied a similar uh, tracing tool. Uh, they are, the participation percentage is very lower. So that means it's not effective. So Korean government have a little bit different approach to contact tracing. They use more directly using the many personal information like uh, credit card used and tran transit card used and also the cell tower, cell phone tower connection data, and then they can uh, generate the, the, the trajectory data of the, each confirmed case, and then they open this information to the general public to uh, prevent them to visit the dangerous, uh, vulnerable place. And also, if they know the similar time and the same place they visited, they can get the uh, uh, diagnostic test. So, uh, one the there is a one the government funded a big smart city R and D project, and in order to support in this kind of a COVID nineteen epidemiological survey, uh, this uh, R and D project team actually developed it very quickly, making all of this uh, data collection and request and trajectory generation process using as a one system. It is called the COVID-19 epidemiological survey support system. And they automated the process of data request, approval, and delivery from the, uh, the, the government to police office and credit card company and other communication uh, company. And, all of this uh, data request and collection and the trajectory generation process is uh, automatically done. So previously, before this uh, system developed it, uh, this investigation generally took at least one day. But uh, the government says that they uh, using this system, all of this uh, data collection process is uh, only took 10 minutes. So we can very quickly respond to uh, the, uh, the case of the corona COVID-19. So this is a more specific uh, structure of the system. And so many mobile phone uh, location data and police department uh, CCTV image data and credit card use data and public transit use data and government owned the personal identification data, all of these are combined and generate the trajectory of the confirmed case. 
and some information is uh, open to the public and to making the citizen to have a much more preventive behavior. Uh, the other interesting uh, system the Korean government introduced is a QR code based uh, digital list system. So the government uh, asked to every the high risk facility like uh, karaoke and nightclubs and buffet restaurant and why the large fitness clubs and they have to left the manually who are the visitor their contact information but protecting these uh, manually written information is also a problem to protect the privacy of the visitors so Korean government developed this uh, digital recording system to based on QR code. And the characteristic of this QR code based system is uh, they divided the personal information uh, using the QR code. And, and this uh, personal information connected to QR code is only uh, stored in the ICT company who issued the QR code. And the business owner side, the visitor information is uh, stored to the, the one public agency called the social security, the, they, they are the social repair the information system comp, uh, public agency. And when only the world patient is confirmed as a positive in COVID-19, these two separated data is matched and then used for contact tracing. So by separating the collected data, the government tried to ensure the privacy. Uh, the other the approach using the personal location information is uh, uh, the cell tower personal location, the case of using cell tower personal location data. And this is the most uh, debatable one actually. And Korean government utilized the cell tower connection data to identify a person at risk of infections in the two cases. Mainly the one is uh, the Itaewon club. Uh, it's uh, the second wave of Korea's uh, COVID-19. Uh, and at this time, the, they used uh, this uh, cell tower connection data and they identified the visitor at, at this uh, Itaewon clubs and then they making them to get the diagnosis test for COVID-19. And similarly, more recently, the, there was a very huge uh, uh, rally to oppose to the government uh, policy uh, in the last months, like the, these pictures. So the, but the problem was uh, several the confirmed patients actually participated in this rally. So, so uh, government investigated uh, the the one who visited and uh, participated in these rallies and then they making them to uh, get the diagnosis test. So these uh, three is uh, the main approach of the how the Korean uh, government using the digital technology and the loca personal, loca personal and location data to respond to the corona pandemics. And, but, as you expected, there is a many the privacy concern and debate was actually uh, was exist. And the main critic was come from the many other Western country news media, like the uh, the data collection was uh, too much in South Korea for contact tracing. And that kind of critic was uh, very common. But in Korea, the interesting thing is a. Uh, many Korean citizens actually wanted to open and disclose the compound case uh, trajectory data more specifically because they want to, they do not want to visit the place if the, the compound uh, patient visited. So uh, when the government minimized the information disclosure, the, there are some group of people asking the most specific information have to be uh, 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 disclosed for the general public. So we can understand that this kind of situation as uh, some kind of a uh, conflict between the right to know and uh, 
versus and the privacy, the protection of privacy. The other very debatable situation was uh, in the Itaewon Club case, the first confirmed case, uh, the, this Itaewon Club was uh, actually the gay clubs. And then the first confirmed person was also, we don't know if he was a gay or not, but anyway, he visited these gay clubs. And then the government making these people to get the test. And this kind of uh, uh, work practice actually making this uh, LGBT group in falsely outing their, their uh, sexual the orientation. So this kind of things is, was very debatable whether we have to protect their information as a human right perspective. And also the, there was some critique by the Korean news media about using the cellular tower connection data so uh, as a response to this kind of critics, as uh, you expected, the Korean government actually make several revisions to the guide, guideline for information disclosure regarding the COVID-19 patient, COVID patients, their travel trajectory to ensure their privacy. So uh, the information disclosure duration is also minimized and uh, data is uh, the information deleted immediately after when the contact tracing is completed. And initially the gender and AAC and other relevant information is open together, but now no longer this information is disclosed. And many the name of the place uh, opening this information is minimized. The other interesting policy trend in Korea is uh, now the many public agency actually experience looking at the, how the Korean disease control uh, department using this uh, personal location data. And initially these uh, personal location data using the, the smart device was only limitedly permitted for emergency rescue for the fire department. Actually it started in 2005 and only allowed to police department in 2013 and the disease control purpose in 2016. But now many public uh, department know the usefulness of this information. So uh, more recently, the Ministry of uh, Interior and Safety, uh, they want to make uh, some kind of a system to using this personal location information as for the purpose of disaster response, such as the, uh, the finding some pers the person who cannot evacuate in the emergency situation and then supporting them, something like that. So this means uh, the many more public purpose, uh, there is uh, some more needs to using the, this kind of personal private data and location. So in conclusions, uh, the data technology-based COVID-19 management uh, shows uh, the conflict between the usefulness of smart technology and privacy, con uh, privacy protections. But in Korean case, the privacy is uh, very important, but many people tend to accept the use of personal information for the purpose, public purpose. So, Maybe there are several reasons why the Korean is much more generous to using their private information for the public purpose. So one of the reason is that we have a re resident registration number system and already this information is uh, many through the hacking or other process. It's very difficult to protect the personal private information. So it's a kind of a citizen already forgive about that, uh, give up about that. Or the other, on the other hand, uh, people uh, experience and they are now know about the effectiveness of the COVID-19 prevention using this data. So they can believe uh, if this data is well uh, applied for the public purpose, they can get a much better service for to save their life or prevent some uh, uh, ensure the safety and security. So in this perspective, in this uh, context, maybe in the future of smart city service in Korea, 
in I believe the public sector is a new service can more, much easily distributed and because uh, many citizens in Korea much more actively uh, and they can easily agree to use for their personal information for the public purpose. Of course, in the private sector, it's much more difficult, but when they know about the awareness of this, uh, people now know about how their personal private location information used for the public purpose. So they now know the communication company uh, store their location information. So if they, the, these private sectors respond very well and they make some kind of system to use uh, pseudonymous data, maybe the future of a smart city service could be much more, uh, more actively we can develop many smart city services. And for the, this, uh, of course, the, this uh, process, uh, we need to ensure the main principle of uh, privacy management in smart city, like the much more transparency in data collection and data use and the process of uh, voluntary consent. Uh, so that's always uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Jung Sub. Um, <laughs> we're running a bit over time here, but uh, that was, uh, we can just manage one question from tools to human. Maybe you mean you could respond to the, to the question. So, um, because uh, you can also see it in the chat, but tools asked, how do you, how did you ensure the involvement uh, from parts of the citizens who are not so IT intelligent? Um, so maybe you can just respond. Uh, she, she already did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but uh, but we can only see the the. It's for the. Um, we are recording this also, so we don't see the chat in the recording. So. You mean you need to uh, unmute your mic? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so thank you very much for the question. And I agree with that point that uh, such app based projects like M voting is missing out. Um, so we're not hearing from seniors who may not be so familiar with using those smart apps and whatnot. Yeah, although some seniors are very tech savvy, though. But <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, there is that kind of a challenge for those kind of projects. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, maybe we can take one more question if there's any questions, but I know that most of you are busy. So um, if there's one final question, can you just type in the chat if you have a question? Um, well, I don't think there are any, but uh, so I think I will, um, in the interest of people's busy schedules, I will say thank you to the presenters for the really interesting uh, presentations and getting giving us an update of what's going on in Korea and what has historically been going on with smart city development. Um, yes, so I would like to say thank you to the to Doshik and Jung Sop and Jung Won and Yumin for joining this. Uh, oh, there seems to be one question now. Uh, no. That was an old, <laughs> old message. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for joining this session. And uh, I hope we will be able to hear from you maybe next year if anything new has been going on. Uh, so I would like to say thank you.